Well, good afternoon. My name is Leon Scott. I'm one of the faculty members with uh, the VUMC Department of Orthopedics. Uh, I am here today uh, speaking about the uh, Vanderbilt Health uh, Associated and Affiliated Network uh, and the effort over this past year to create the Care Path Guide for Osteoarthritis. Uh, this is a, a series of guidelines uh, that the uh, network uh, wanted to put together and asked for input from uh, local primary care providers and from groups, multidisciplinary group, including our Department of Orthopedics. And uh, well, hope to release this in the uh, spring or early components of uh, 2021. But this is the first of a few uh, sessions, video sessions, to just introduce the idea uh, uh, to the group of uh, primary care providers um, and other uh, uh, MSK providers who are a part of this um, a pathway so that we can all create and provide standardized uh, treatment uh, for patients with knee and hip osteoarthritis. I have no disclosures. And for CME credit, I'll leave this uh, image up for just a moment so you can uh, take down the CME code at the top in yellow. Uh, potentially uh, screenshot the instructions. Uh, this slide will also be at the end of the talk. <clears throat> the objectives I have for today are to introduce uh, osteoarthritis and kind of redefine it for everyone, make sure we're all working on the same uh, definition, and then review the clinical assessment techniques and treatment options uh, that are uh, recommended uh, by our organizations. Uh, these will uh, add on to some of the uh, uh, guidelines that uh, currently exist, uh, hopefully bringing to bear the latest evidence into a workable algorithm uh, for all of uh, the providers uh, in this uh, uh, region. First, when we mention arthritis, I think it's helpful to remember that arthritis is just the presence of pain within a joint arthralgia plus an objective finding. Uh, that objective finding may be uh, changes in the uh, x-ray findings. It may be uh, the uh, presence of an effusion within a joint. It can be the redness or heat emanating from, uh, from a joint, the uh, uh, rubor and calor uh, 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 that we've all learned about in early medical training. But osteoarthritis, unlike other types of arthritis, is uh, specifically arthritis that's attributable to degenerative changes within the joint surface. Now, that could be irregularities in the cartilage surface. If we use this model of the knee, irregularities in the cartilage surface that line the bone ends, uh, that could be the irregularity from uh, bone changes that may have occurred uh, from uh, reactions to stress or past fractures. Uh, and that degenerative joint surface is then uh, uh, exposed to gradual mechanical injury. Uh, for example, when standing up, we use our thigh muscles to help extend the knee, but if we don't have a similar amount of strength coming from our, our bottoms, from our glutes, uh, helping to ex uh, extend the hip, then with every bending moment, with every uh, torque that happens around a joint, there may be a shearing that happens uh, in addition, so that gradual mechanical injury uh, in uh, uh, practice tends to be associated with a repetitive overuse shearing that can take place uh, at the joint surface. And then with those degenerative changes and the continual gradual mechanical injury, the basement membrane, the actual cushion that makes up cartilage and lines uh, the soft tissues of the knee, that area can be irritated and leak cytokines. And that cytokine storm can lead to a chemical inflammation, including metalloproteases, different proteins that further break down the joint surface, leading to a negative spiral downward and more degenerative joint surface changes. It seems in adults uh, that the persistent gradual mechanical injury, potentially from poor muscular conditioning, kind of keeps 
the injury going so it just never seems to stop and never seems to be able to uh, uh, complete the healing process. Now, that describes osteoarthritis, but that is specifically different from uh, arthritis that's directly related to acute trauma or joint pain from acute trauma, uh, which may actually not be termed arthritis uh, commonly, but more uh, acute sprains and strains and uh, things of that nature. It's, uh, osteoarthritis is also not directly related to an active infectious process. Uh, that is a caustic arthritis, a uh, crystalline deposit like gout, um, um, uh, and the associated white blood cells entering into a joint space to remove those crystals. Uh, that can be an erosive arthritis. Um, uh, and, and the inflammatory processes seen in autoimmune disease also being erosive. Uh, so those are different types of primary arthritis that's different from osteoarthritis, although osteoarthritis can be a secondary effect of those uh, preceding uh, insults to a joint. Within our country, in a, any person's lifetime or within the uh, population's lifetime, there's about a 45% chance that uh, an individual will have osteoarthritis of the knees and a 25% chance that they'll have it within the hips. At any one time, including uh, right now with best estimates, 30 million individuals are uh, dealing with osteoarthritis symptoms in the hip or knees. Out of the 330 million in this country, that definitely seems like a lot, but what is also concerning is that in the next less than 10 years, by 2030, the estimate is that 70 million people will be uh, dealing with osteoarthritis. And we believe that's related to a combination of aging, uh, a, a combination of uh, poor conditioning, uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, all of those things are starting to move the population into one where more and more people are managing osteoarthritis. Uh, in terms of the uh, economic effect, just from hip and knee replacements, uh, the latest information is that our country spends $42 billion on those surgeries. Uh, to give a little perspective, the total healthcare spend in this country is about $4 trillion. Uh, so it's about 1% of that. And for even that much to go to just this one grouping of procedures, uh, it definitely seems like a large amount. So hopefully we're all getting a sense of the impact that osteoarthritis of the hips and knees can have on the population. But it's also important when we have our patient in front of us to see how it affects them. And one of the ways that we do that is with patient reported outcome questionnaires. Uh, the uh, uh, first three listed here are general and behavioral patient reported outcomes. The PROMISE score, which is gonna look at uh, physical, uh, emotional, and, uh, uh, and other uh, well-being measures. Uh, the, uh, the patient health uh, questionnaire nine and two are mental health questionnaires, the screening for depression. Uh, those two are specifically used if someone is going to have a knee replacement uh, so that we can have a way of gauging the risk that they may have more post-operative pain. But for the specific processes of osteoarthritis in the hips and knees, we have scores like the KOOS and the HOOS scores, and then their junior scores. Are, uh, uh, those scores are helpful for identifying uh, pain. Uh, functional symptoms that impact activities of daily living and other symptoms uh, that uh, are associated with these uh, ailments and giving us an objective score on a 100 point scale. And I am finding that those are extremely helpful when talking to a patient about what treatments are available so that we can at least give an estimate on the average expected improvement from certain treatments. Uh, these scoring systems used to be just done on paper and they required manual scoring. Uh, over the course of three months up through March of 2021, uh, Vanderbilt's Department of Orthopedics will be uh, instituting electronic versions of these in the My Health at Vanderbilt and other uh, kiosks during the check-in process. Uh, so we hope that we will be able to uh, uh, track and gauge the improvements that our patients experience uh, with treatments uh, using these scores. When we get the history, we know that you're busy, especially uh, in uh, many of your primary care offices. Uh, 
with the number of patients and uh, conditions that you're managing. So a concise history can be helpful. Uh, we have found uh, through screening the literature uh, that these combinations, of, this combination of questions will help identify those with the highest likelihood ratio of having osteoarthritis. So if the age is over 40, uh, if there is a uh, no recent history of trauma, and if over the past four weeks there have been these combination of symptoms. Now, if someone answers no to some of these questions, the probability is still high, uh, but uh, answering in the affirmative for most of these and in the negative for the trauma question uh, can help discern between, can help identify individuals with hip and knee osteoarthritis. Uh, of note, when an individual is having pain with stairs, that's more closely associated with knee arthritis, although uh, uh, also present with uh, hip. And difficulty of putting on socks and shoes is more specific uh, to hip osteoarthritis. The examination uh, uh, includes tests for range of motion. Uh, advanced osteoarthritis will be met with limited joint extension in the knee, joint flexion in the knee, and limited internal rotation of the hip. A positive pain with log roll um, uh, can be uh, uh, helpful for identifying individuals with uh, hip osteoarthritis. Uh, for those who do not have hip osteoarthritis, it has a high specificity. Uh, the uh, patellar grind test where an individual is asked to contract their thigh muscle and their uh, patella is uh, then compressed against the femoral uh, uh, end in the trochlear groove. Uh, if you are putting pressure on the kneecap as they're contracting the muscle, uh, that uh, may elicit pain in the patellofemoral joint compartment of the knee. Uh, also, if there's tenderness along the joint line, uh, that can go along with uh, uh, pain associated with knee osteoarthritis. Now, to be fair, these tests are not incredibly sensitive or specific on their own. Really, uh, these plus other tests are more helpful for ruling out other things. Is there an ACL tear? Is there a sprain of the MCL? Uh, is this uh, likely related to a meniscus issue? So what I'm hoping is that next month, uh, at a, uh, the second Tuesday of the month, uh, I will be hosting another talk that goes through more detail on the exam and specifically how to uh, more effectively utilize ideas like the uh, likelihood ratios so that you can have almost a catalog of exams that you do where you know if this is positive, that's positive, and this is positive, there is a very high chance that this is the offending issue. Uh, so uh, for today's talk, just knowing that the exam is completed, but it's not incredibly high sensitivity or specificity, uh, but we'll be going through those uh, tests that help rule out other issues so that osteoarthritis becomes a more likely uh, cause for their pain. Um, we'll be going again through that next month. Uh, in your uh, evaluation, it is also helpful uh, to obtain imaging, and we'll talk about when. Uh, if you are getting imaging for knee or hip osteoarthritis, uh, I recommend ordering uh, images in this manner. Uh, for a knee x-ray, a four-view weight-bearing series is uh, the most helpful. Uh, an AP weight-bearing, a Rosenberg, which an AP is going to be a front view. A Rosenberg is going to be a weight-bearing posterior view with 45 degrees of knee bend. So the patient is in a little half squat. The uh, images from that view help us better identify if there are weight-bearing uh, joint space changes. Uh, so that's a new one that perhaps um, uh, is not incredibly familiar uh, for, with uh, our team members around the region. A lateral weight-bearing x-ray and then a merchant view, which is a view of the knee flexed where you're looking at how the kneecap sits within the groove. For the hip, uh, a weight-bearing AP pelvis, uh, and then a weight-bearing lateral, it could be a done lateral or a frog leg, uh, and the weight-bearing there is done with the uh, leg on a step stool, so the x-ray teams uh, do have those tools available. Uh, perhaps in the uh, walking clinic, uh, that might be something we'd have to verify. Uh, when we get these images, it can be incredibly helpful to uh, have a sense of 
how progressed degenerative disorders are. And within the actual care path, uh, you'll be able to find, uh, uh, once this is released, we'll be able to find that information uh, cataloged. So I won't go through all the details here, but I do think it'll be helpful to at least go through uh, some images in just a moment. Uh, so a kelgren lawrence scale of zero is a normal knee. There we see no osteophytes, bone spurs. We see no joint space narrowing, and we see uh, no sclerosis or whitening through parts of the uh, uh, bony ends. A kelgren lawrence one, and I apologize, this image is a little over uh, saturated and expanded, uh, but what we see here is uh, that the uh, uh, osteophytes are possible. And usually I see those on a lateral view underneath the superior apex of the uh, tela. Uh, the joint space is doubtfully low, which for me, when you're measuring joint space, and it is different for everyone, but if you have five millimeters of space, uh, you have a normal joint space. So doubtful for me is when I look at it and see those tibial eminences, those two spines uh, rising up if I see them getting close to the femoral condyle, I go, oh, oh, maybe there's joint space narrowing, but then I measure it and it's still five millimeters. So I say, yeah, it's doubtful. Uh, uh, and then no sclerosis. The kelgren lawrence II, now the osteophytes are definite. We can see those osteophytes on the margin of the lateral joint space there. The uh, joint space narrowing is possible and it looks like it may be narrowed. It is possible because it can be hard to tell where the anterior and posterior wall of the tibial plateau is, but to believe that this would be less than five millimeters. And there's still no notable sclerosis. kilgren lawrence three is now where we have moderate uh, uh, sized osteophytes. Uh, we have uh, definite joint space narrowing and we have that sclerosis. Notice this white hue around the medial bone. And then kelgren lawrence 4, that's essentially bone on bone, but large osteophytes, no joint space, and significant sclerosis. Next, we'll talk about the hip. I'm just going to grab something really quickly, a little sip of water. All right. So within the hip scoring, called the tonus scoring system, uh, also within that care path uh, to refer back to. But if we take a look at the upcoming left hip uh, images here, uh, we'll see for this tonus zero that there is no joint space narrowing. And this again is a five millimeter uh, space uh, with weight bearing. And one of the little clues is that it looks like it opens up on the way out. It doesn't pinch down. Uh, hopefully you can see my cursor here the joint space is stable, and then it almost opens up or appears like it's opening up on the side. Uh, so uh, there we have uh, joint spaces maintained. We have uh, no cysts present in the, and I'll show examples of what a bony cyst looks like. We also don't have uh, any deformity of the socket, the acetabulum, or the femoral head. Uh, for tonus one, uh, we have some a possible narrowing here. And this is where I see more than two millimeters, but less than five millimeters of space. And it almost looks like it's closing off a little bit here. Uh, not as open as the last one. So some slight joint space narrowing, no cystic changes, no clear deformity. Uh, for tonus two, now we have uh, a, a present joint space narrowing. You see where that's narrowed. It's not bone on bone, but it's narrowing at the end there. Uh, and then we also have some cystic changes. So it takes a little bit of practice, but there's a cyst here, a small cyst here, and one here on the acetabulum side. There's a, another here as well. Uh, so we have some cystic changes with no clear evidence of deformity. You might see some bone spurs uh, 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 on the femoral head through the lateral view here, but not on this AP. Uh, and then the tonus three, this is where the joint space is obliterated, where we have large cystic changes here, and we can see that deformity of the acetabulum. And I'm certain uh, we would see some bone spurring on the lateral view. I suspect this is a large spur development down through here. Uh, so that will hopefully help review the assessment techniques, the history, the exam, how to evaluate the x-ray in an effective way. 
Uh, now, I wanted to go into the algorithm and introduce the treatments as we go through that. So the first step of our algorithm, which is going to be and is uh, within the, uh, the care path, uh, is the visit with the primary care provider, during which uh, you are uh, um, uh, going to go through that history and exam and you can uh, order the x-ray uh, images and then going through uh, and identifying if there are any red flags through that early assessment uh, before deciding if there is another action that needs to take place or if conservative care is what's needed. Uh, so what are those red flag action bullets? Uh, we have them listed as identifying if there is a risk for septic arthritis, if there's joint pain with fever and non-weight bearing, at that point, it's probably in everyone's best interest to do an emergent orthopedic referral or referral to an emergency department to rule out the possibility of septic arthritis. Even if you say, well, there's no effusion in the knee, we wanna make sure we're not missing something like an osteo, uh, um, uh, um, I apologize brain freeze there. We want to make sure we're not missing an osteomyelitis, an infection within the bone. Uh, so uh, with fever, non-weight bearing uh, with that fever and pain uh, in the joint that's le leading to that patient not weight bearing, we, then we want to get a, uh, a more urgent evaluation. Uh, if there is acute pain that has occurred with trauma, but the patient is weight bearing, that's when it may be a meniscus issue or it might be an ACL or an MCL. A four view weight bearing x-ray series is still um, important here. And if you are um, uh, seeing that in, across your office and you're hoping for support uh, appropriate to do a referral to sports medicine. If there's acute pain, it's been traumatic, but the patient is not weight bearing, this may be more severe of an injury. Yes, it may still be a ligamentous soft tissue injury, but fractures are really what we're concerned about here. So here we don't worry too much about the weight bearing x-rays, getting AP and a lateral uh, and referral to either sports medicine or the trauma offices. By calling the Vanderbilt Orthopedics main line, our call staff will help discern if it's an issue uh, that needs to be seen by either sports medicine or trauma. So you don't have to worry too much about having one phone number or the other. Uh, the orthopedic line for Vanderbilt uh, will help with both. If there is a non-traumatic effusion, uh, a patient walks in just says, hey, my knee is swollen. Well, then the x-rays uh, again can be helpful. In office, you are aspirating, evaluating the aspirate to see if there is a possibility of crystalline arthritis like gout or uh, white blood cells uh, that may represent an uh, increased risk or chance of autoimmune arthritis. Um, uh, then based on what you find, referring to rheumatology, referring to uh, uh, orthopedics, um, uh, with uh, gout and autoimmune disorders, rheumatology being the, the, uh, the best long-term option there. Uh, if there's acute pain in the knee uh, that's non-traumatic, uh, it's also important to remember um, oncology. Uh, there may be a, a primary bone tumor or metastasis uh, uh, leading to the bone. Uh, so x-rays here would be helpful. And then conservative care, but if there's an abnormality, referring out and remembering that oncology, our ortho-oncology team is also available uh, through that same uh, uh, Vanderbilt Orthopedics call number. Now, if none of those red flags are present, then the patient may have chronic uh, pain that you would treat as osteoarthritis. Uh, the x-ray is being helpful there, conservative care that we're about to address. But if it is recalcitrant to that conservative care, then based on the x-ray findings, uh, please feel encouraged to refer to our total joint, our recon team, Dr. Polkowski, uh, Dr. Ingstrom, Dr. Shiner, uh, to discuss uh, if the patient it would be best suited for joint replacement or other treatment options um, uh, that uh, you may find are just outside of the uh, efficient workflow that your office needs. So uh, the instructions or the recommendations are there. Now, what about that conservative care? The conservative care includes lifestyle modifications, lifestyle modifications, lifestyle modifications, pharmacotherapy, uh, including injections, 
bracing. And there's even uh, uh, the uh, new development of genicular nerve ablation, radiofrequency ablation, uh, especially for patients who are poor surgical candidates. We're gonna go through some of these here and some of the evidence uh, for lifestyle modifications and for all of osteoarthritis, the number one recommendation throughout organizations, professional organizations, is strengthening. Uh, you may remember uh, we were talking about how osteoarthritis is associated with the persistent mechanical injury. And I was associating that with a shearing injury that can happen in addition to the uh, moment arm torque around a joint as a person moves. If there is not balanced strength between the muscles of the front of the thigh and the muscles of the back of the thigh uh, or the, um, uh, all the other stabilizing muscles around the hip, then in addition to the uh, desired bending that a person may do when they're trying to sit, there can also be a shifting and a shearing, creating essentially a rug burn of the surface inside. It is strength weight-bearing exercise that helps train us out of that. It helps distribute stress uh, on the other tissues. Yes, that's true. But it helps condition us so that we are able to move more appropriately and we stop the recurrent mechanical injury to our knee. Uh, as a little anecdote that supports this, you may notice that individuals who run and exercise regularly, and maybe they're in their 60s or 70s, and they come in and they say, oh, I know my knees are shot. I've been running all my life and exercising all my life and I have some knee pain. And then you get an image and you realize that their knee looks like it's a 20 year old's knee. Uh, whereas someone who's 40 or 50, uh, who is more sedentary uh, uh, and maybe works on the line at GM, so um, uh, sedentary at home, not training, but overuse, they have bone on bone arthritis at a young age. And yes, other things contribute like family history, but the conditioning that uh, that first patient in the example uh, 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 does uh, uh, regularly is protective. Uh, so uh, weight-bearing resistance exercise is protective. Although not compared head-to-head, -head, the things that have been shown to be equally helpful, physical therapy with the inclusion of manual therapy like massage, if there's range of motion limitations, and a real focus on balance. The stronger a person's ability to balance, the less likely they're going to have that microscopic shearing happening at the joint. Strength training at the gym, yoga, aqua resistance, all have been shown to be helpful. But if a person is not uh, already conditioned for exercise at the gym, like uh, strength training, physical therapy is where you want to start. These are more effective than walking. Yes, walking has been shown to improve a person's ability to walk more but it is not going to help them necessarily with getting up and down stairs. It's not going to be helpful for protecting against that twisting movement when they're working in the garden. So walking is better than nothing, but physical therapy and strength training is better. Uh, education, us giving the Cranes paperwork, uh, uh, it, in theory makes us feel good, but the truth is it it's always the control against which things are judged. Uh, so as much as we can, we need to encourage people to uh, exercise more uh, 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 effectively than uh, just providing uh, a pamphlet with uh, exercises and hoping that they accomplish them. The next uh, suggestion that has moderate support, in part because the studies are underpowered, is weight loss. Now, the weight loss recommendations from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery is a BMI goal of less than 25. That is only partially because of the science behind osteoarthritis. Uh, the recommendation was also made because of, in general, the health benefits of uh, a decreased uh, risk of uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, the things that you all know much more about than, than I do. Um, uh, those uh, the recommendations for addressing obesity and overweight uh, uh, body composition uh, along with the treatment of osteoarthritis is why uh, that specific recommendation was made, a BMI of less than 25. But if we actually look at the research, what's been identified is that a 10% weight loss is associated with a 10% improvement in functional scores. Now, uh, a 10% improvement is not 100%. So, 
uh, many people may not say that they notice that much of a difference, but for many individuals that we care for, uh, the 10% may be the beginning uh, of what may be uh, uh, an even higher percentage, 20, 30% we lost for them to get down to that BMI of 25 goal. Uh, the amount of time it took for this to happen in research studies, two months to six months. Uh, so uh, uh, the average uh, weight for the individuals in these studies was in the 250 to 300 pound range. Uh, so uh, the two months to six months to have a 25 to 30 pound uh, weight loss. Uh, and that took a lot of uh, counseling and coordinating, including weekly sessions, uh, things that we may not have access to uh, in our practices. Uh, so uh, hopefully we can uh, gain the support of our, uh, uh, our obesity management uh, medical team uh, so that they can help manage with that, uh, uh, manage the consistent follow-up. Uh, now the next treatment tool are, is the use of NSAIDs and other pharmacotherapy tools for reducing pain. Uh, ibuprofen, uh, Toradol, uh, whether it's ingested orally, topically, or injected, uh, all of these tools can be helpful. Uh, within the care path, the, uh, one of the components that takes up the most space is the table uh, within uh, that you will gain access to once this is published, the tables of different uh, pain and uh, arthritis symptom related medicines. So uh, the, the list is long. Uh, hopefully we're all able to find our favorite to work with and then adjust based on how an individual patient responds. Uh, tramadol has also been shown to be helpful for osteoarthritis pain. Uh, uh, both NSAIDs and tramadol more effective than acetaminophen. But of course, there might be greater symptomatic benefit, but there can be risk with these medicines. NSAIDs, risks with uh, allergy, uh, renal issues, GI distress, and tramadols, the concern for, um, for uh, dependency, for respiratory suppression with interactions with other medications. So we have to be very aware of these risks, and I personally avoid tramadol as much as possible. Uh, are there other tools that can be helpful? Well, yes, uh, there may be some uh, over-the-counter tools like TENS units, electrical stimulation units to help uh, uh, relieve the sensation of pain. But at the bottom of this list, you may notice supplements, other oral tools that are uh, pharmacotherapy that aren't uh, governed by the FDA, but uh, may still provide uh, some benefits. So uh, just quickly, uh, when it comes to popular supplements, the recommendations for glucosamine and chondroitin, uh, compared to the placebo, there is not consistent measurable benefit. Uh, so it's relatively expensive, $60 for a month supply. Uh, it may in uh, increase the blood sugar. Uh, so uh, ultimately, uh, it's a supplement that I don't strongly recommend. Uh, so feel free to uh, use that information with your uh, with your pa patients. Some tools that do seem to have benefit include uh, avocado soybean unsaponifiables. We call them ASUs. Uh, a company called Arthrocene uh, uh, has these available. Uh, they were they are prescriptions in Europe, but in the U.S. you can get them on Amazon. Uh, Thirty dollars for a two month supply. Uh, so might be one of the greater bargains. Uh, the adverse events are similar to placebo. Uh, it seems to reduce inflammation and encourage cartilage cells to lay down new basement membranes, so it may actually help recover cartilage. Uh, so this is a tool that uh, I recommend regularly. Uh, turmeric or curcumin domestica uh, is a nutritional supplement that can help with uh, pain. Uh, it acts similarly to NSAIDs uh, inhibiting COX-1 and COX-2. So be cautious if someone is using turmeric and also uh, a daily meloxicam, they may have some upset stomach and you need to make sure you re uh, remember to advise them that perhaps they need to back off for their turmeric or their meloxicam, one or the other. Uh, CBD oil, uh, the benefits to placebo not established. Of course, it's a big fad now. Uh, it, there may be a cross reaction with warfarin, so being very cautious with our elderly patients here. 
And then the last group of pharmacotherapies that I want to talk about were the injections, uh, the use of corticosteroid. Uh, although we have good evidence that corticosteroid can reduce pain throughout the body, uh, there's not much great evidence for its use in knee and hip arthritis. There are a couple of studies compared to placebo, and it shows a short one-month benefit in pain. Uh, patients frequently tell me that the symptoms start to come back uh, over a course of three months, uh, but there is no actual uh, uh, written support from the AAOS on using corticosteroids, and that may be in part because of the brief benefit and the fact that there is growing evidence that recurrent steroid injection can actually uh, encourage further deterioration of the uh, joint surface. Uh, so we have to be very careful if we're going to start using and continue to use corticosteroid as our main treatment tool, something that I really am trying to get away from. Uh, but uh, uh, as long as we are aware of the risk and counsel, it's not just increased blood pressure and blood sugar. Uh, we see that one injection every three months for two years will cause a decrease in joint space compared to if it, uh, in other injectants. So uh, something to be very aware of. Hyaluronic acid, the gel injections, uh, when greater than 750,000 kilodaltons are associated with improved pain by reducing inflammation within the joint. Uh, the benefits are measurably more than placebo, although they are relatively small. Uh, so there's actually not a consensus on if these are useful. Uh, many patients, you may have patients who've told you, yeah, I didn't feel any benefit. And that's what I see frequently. I think it's about 30% of people who report that these are helpful. Uh, and then orthobiologics, uh, a tool that I use, uh, platelet-rich plasma. You'll also hear about stem cells. But uh, regardless of the specific injectant in the orthobiologic group, the idea is that there is a, uh, an injection of a tool in concentrate that will encourage the tissue to, uh, to regenerate more, uh, as we see in, the, uh, in lab studies, reduce inflammation so it reduces further breakdown of the basement membrane that's present. Um, and that is a uh, group of injectants that is really showing positive effects, but it is not considered a, uh, a medicine at this point because we cannot consistently give the same dose with each injection. Your uh, injectant is made of your own platelets and your platelet count may be different on different days, uh, different ages, different uh, uh, male or female uh, gender are associated with different amounts of alpha granules on the platelets. So everyone kind of gets a different dose. Uh, this is currently only provided out of pocket um, uh, uh, as a service in our offices. Now, in comparison, uh, when we look at corticosteroid, uh, the white curve, hyaluronic acid, the blue curve, and uh, the orthobiologic, specifically platelet-rich plasma, the yellow curve, we can see when compared to placebo saline, how much improvement uh, is uh, typically experienced. This is on a 10 point scale. So if they measured on their VAS score, uh, a seven out of 10 pain at rest and a nine out of 10 with activity, uh, these would be the improvements that we on average would expect to see with the different injectants. Steroid often bringing the pain down uh, by a point and a half uh, compared to saline hyaluronic acid less than that, uh, PRP uh, sometimes more than that. Uh, what, uh, should be, uh, rem uh, what I should remind you, everyone of though is that saline when injected also seems to reduce pain. So the gross effects of all of these injectants is a little bit more than what's measured here. This is just when compared to saline. You may also be asking, well, what about braces? We found uh, the uh, orthopedic institutions have found that the use of knee sleeves and fancy hinged knee braces, uh, there may not be much difference between the two, although both provide uh, comfort and improvement in knee pain for, uh, uh, for knee osteoarthritis. There are some new hip braces being made. The, they are really experimental at this point, so no real data on that. 
lateral wedges, a tool that used to be used to unload the inside of someone's knee, uh, not found to be beneficial. So those are not recommended any longer. So knee sleeves, hinge braces, whether $12 or $1,200, probably provide the same amount of benefit. Yes, there will be nuanced differences between individuals, but for the general population, that seems to be the case. So if you have now gone through your algorithm, found no red flags, chronic knee pain that you believe is osteoarthritis of the knee, and you've gone through the conservative care, lifestyle modifications, the use of pharmacotherapies, uh, the possible use of injectants, the use of bracing, then following up at six weeks is a perfect plan. And if you see that symptoms have improved, you just continue with that plan as you have set out. If you don't see improvements, you can revise care using the care pathway to try a different inset, to add on a brace, to consider a new injection, the gel injections. Uh, but of course, if you find that the symptoms are not improving and you have that x-ray to review against, if you find KL3 and KL4 changes, a referral to our joint replacement specialist, not for a guaranteed joint replacement, but for consultation on that idea. Uh, and if there are KL1 changes, an MRI of the knee can be ordered uh, and referral to sports medicine. And KL2 changes, just referral to sports medicine where we can discuss treatments uh, like the orthobiologics treatments that, uh, that I offer. If you do uh, refer someone for a joint replacement, it can be helpful to have a sense of what's actually gonna happen. I feel like frequently uh, orthopedics, uh, we will uh, receive your patients, but our communication directly may not be so clear on exactly what those steps are with surgery. Uh, yes, our, our notes get you in, uh, but we know everyone is busy. So hopefully this will give you a general sense. Uh, Preoperatively, we get clearance from the individual's primary care providers, from other specialists. We also do joint replacement classes. So there is a common bedrock on what type of recovery process should be expected, uh, what type of uh, supports you'll need from family, having food in the house. Uh, this is an opportunity for answering questions. Uh, patients really seem to enjoy these classes uh, put on by our PAs and MPs. Then we have the joint replacement, uh, which many of which are moving to same-day surgery. Hip replacements, uh, about a third of them are being done as uh, same-day surgeries. Knee replacements are moving uh, into that as well. Uh, the more complications are present, uh, 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 pre-operative comorbidities, uh, the more likely there will be a post-operative stay uh, with uh, physical therapy evaluations and the uh, setup for physical therapy. Uh, we are starting to include uh, uh, video physical therapy, uh, especially with hip replacements, a series of videos that can be watched at home uh, that help uh, uh, give patients a measurably equal experience and benefit without the hassle of trying to drive uh, and get to a, a therapy office. So uh, more information on that coming out as we continue to test that. Uh, there are visits, post-operative visits, the two-week visit with the uh, physician extender uh, for uh, staple removal and wound check, and then a six-week visit, uh, and then follow up as needed in that global period, but oftentimes after that, no further uh, follow-up is needed except the one-year visit. With the hip, it's really the same algorithm uh, with the exceptions being the red flags. So what are those red flags? Uh, if there's concern for a septic joint, non-weight bearing pain within the hip fever, emergent referral to the emergency department, acute pain with weight bearing, uh, that may be an injury to soft tissues within the hip like the labrum, may also be related to uh, uh, some type of uh, metastatic uh, process. Uh, uh, so a referral to sports medicine based on the x-ray report or to another group like uh, the ortho uh, oncology group. Uh, if there's acute pain and there's non-weight bearing, then non-weight bearing views are most appropriate here, looking for fractures. And even uh, uh, in our uh, elderly population with osteoporosis and osteopenia, uh, the slight uh, injuries that can occur with sitting down too quickly uh, can lead to non-displaced femoral neck fractures. So if they're non-weight bearing or having difficulty, uh, non-weight bearing x-rays would be perfectly fine in those scenarios. And if those red flags aren't present, then 
the evaluation and treatment based on our chronic pain uh, treatment plan. That plan is the same plan that we saw for the uh, knee. The only difference being that the viscoelastic hyaluronic injections, those gel injections, are not covered by insurance for the hip. Uh, so those would be out of pocket for the hip as well. When compared head to head, PRP outperforms the gel injections. So in those scenarios with hip arthritis, uh, patients often pick the PRP instead since it would be a cash out of pocket uh, payments uh, for uh, both gel or PRP. Similar, uh, oh, here's that, uh, uh, that algorithm. Uh, similar to the knee, uh, when to provide information on what to expect for uh, hip uh, surgeries, um, the, you'll, you'll find that the process is the, uh, is the same in terms of the preoperative and postoperative courses. And that uh, concludes the summary of information within the care path. Uh, at the end of the care path, there are also resources and references uh, for patients. Uh, so once this is complete and sent uh, to your provider offices, we hope you'll give us feedback and find it valuable for uh, uh, providing streamlined, consistent, uh, top of the line uh, care. Here are the CME, um, uh, here is the CME credit number and the screen uh, has instructions on how to acquire those credits. Uh, feel free to screenshot or take a picture with your camera there. I'll leave that up for a few more seconds. And I'll open the floor to any questions if anyone has any questions. Stop sharing the screen here. All right. Well, I hope this was helpful. Uh, if there aren't any more uh, questions for me, then I will uh, stop the recording now. Uh, thank you again for listening. Thank you.